Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Diagnostics by Rick. My name is Rick Siegel. I'll be your host. A little bit about myself before we get started. I'm an ASC certified master tech in the Atlanta area. I own and operate mobile diagnostic solutions. In the past, I've written and taught several classes locally here in this area. Recently, I've been getting a lot of requests to start teaching classes again. As I began to write the classes, I decided to take a different route. And instead of teaching classes locally, I thought I'd give YouTube a try. So please bear with me if this is my very first attempt at a YouTube video. This channel will cover a variety of diagnostic subjects. However, the one that I am most often asked to teach is on oscilloscopes. So that is where I'm going to start. Even though I'm going to begin with some very basic scope introduction classes, I encourage everyone to watch even these early classes, even if you're already a seasoned user, because you may pick up something that you didn't know, but more importantly, it will show you my teaching style so that perhaps you will get more out of the later, more advanced classes. The field of the oscilloscope is most often used to pinpoint the final diagnosis, even though it is rarely used as a starting point. I use an oscilloscope daily in the diagnostics that I perform for many of the shops around the Atlanta area. I began learning scopes a long time ago on one of the old engine analyzers. I believe it was the Sun 1115, although it might have been a 1015. From there, I got my very first DSO, or Digital Storage Oscilloscope, and that was the Sun LS2000. The Sun LS2000 probably did more for me learning about how to use a scope than the uh, engine analyzer because it allowed for me to save waveforms and go back and review them later. And that is the beauty of any DSO over a live scope. In the past, my classes have all been about four to six hours long. However, I'm not going to make you sit through videos that long. So instead, what I'm going to do is break these videos up into much smaller sections. Again, my first attempt to YouTube, so my goal is somewhere between 25 and 45 minutes. I will do my best to try and keep each partial subject in that window. In this first episode, I want to cover two subjects. One, what is an oscilloscope? And two, why do you need one? In the next episode, we'll have a buyer's guide to discuss which oscilloscope or oscilloscopes you should buy. And then finally, the third video, we will begin talking about the basics of oscilloscope use and we'll get more and more advanced from there. Please bear with me as I learn to use YouTube and make high quality videos and learn to teach in a new format. Feel free to leave uh, feedback and comments as I will be reading them all and take them into consideration. Without further ado, let's get started. So what is an oscilloscope? To illustrate, we're going to use our old Corvette here that I have fitted with a sensor simulator circuit board. Up front, we have it connected to an oscilloscope and to a voltmeter. I found the easiest way to show what an oscilloscope is, is by using the throttle position sensor or another potentiometer. Right here, I have a simulated throttle position sensor on our little test car, and I'm going to use a voltmeter. Now, many of you have already done this test with a voltmeter in the past. You uh, step on the throttle and you can watch the voltage slowly begin to increase. All the way up to its max voltage, generally somewhere around four and a half or five volts. And let off the throttle, it goes back down. The problem with this is it's very difficult to catch a very small glitch in a bad throttle position sensor. So now let's see what that looks like on an oscilloscope. Okay, if we look at it over here on the left-hand side, we can see our voltage scale goes from zero up to five volts and down to negative five volts. Right now, the throttle position sensor is holding steady at about half a volt, and we just see a flat line because I'm not moving the pedal right now. So I'll wait for it the scan to get all the way back to the other side, and then I'm going to slowly start moving the throttle position sensor. Now, as we crank it up, we can see the voltage increase up to about 5 volts, 
if I move it down quick, go all the way to zero, back up to about half volt, which is where it should be. Now the great thing about a DSO, as I mentioned, the digital storage oscilloscope, I can stop, I can back up, you can see what we just recorded on live scope, you can't really do that. Now, if you see my capture, you will see a lot of grass on this capture. This is actually ignition noise. Even my little circuit board over here, which has a secondary ignition component to it, will create a little bit of ignition noise. And I can show that to you. Let me start the scope back up. And you can see the grass right here. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the RPM. speed up the engine, slow the engine down, and you can see the grass gets faster, slower. So it really is just picking up a little bit of ignition noise from my small circuit board. Now in a later episode we will discuss filtering and how to get a cleaner picture, but remember that under the hood of an engine is a very, very noisy environment. So don't get carried away trying to diagnose every tiny little spec that you see on your graph. Uh, in time with practice, you will learn to differentiate which ones are real, and which ones are just noise you're picking up from. Ignition coils are probably the noisiest thing under the hood. When I say noise, I mean electrical noise. And so if you look for a problem hard enough, if we zoom in far enough, you can find something. It's, but that's not real. That's just the nature of how the oscilloscopes work. Different scopes are more sensitive or less sensitive than others. So just don't get too carried away with what is a real problem with a circuit and what is just electrical noise that you happen to be picking up. Using good leads can help, but it won't eliminate all of it. There's actually really nothing you can do to eliminate 100% of the noise. Now let's go back to the voltmeter for a moment. If we wanted to do a full sweep of the TPS, we could move the pedal very slowly and write down each voltage value as it changes. In this chart, I've recorded hundreds of values as the TPS sweeps up, and I did another chart as it sweeps back down that I'm not showing here. Other than taking tremendous amounts of time, can you pick out the bad spot in the sensor? The place where the voltage does not increase in a linear fashion and either jumps up too quickly or goes the wrong direction. The fault is right here. Looking at the previous column, the voltage is down around 1.64 and steadily increases to 1.69. And then it suddenly drops to about 1.26 and hovers there for a bit before getting back on track where it's supposed to be. This would be enough to cause a hesitation in the engine as the pedal passed this point. While I'm sure that everyone would have found the bad spot if I'd just given you a little more time, to look over the numbers, let's graph those numbers and see how much easier it is to see. Now with the graph, I think almost instantly your eyes are drawn to the fault. On the upsweep, the problem is a little bit more prominent than on the downsweep, but that's actually a pretty common on most TPS failures. Often they will fail worse in one direction or may only fail in one direction and not in the other. That's because of how the contact arms sweep across the resistive element. Sometimes they have a little more tension going one direction because of the way the arms are bent. Here's an example from an old Ford Taurus that consistently had a big problem with the TPS on the upsweep, but no matter how hard I tried, I could not get it to fail on the way back down. And let's not forget that there are less than a thousand samples on our graph taken from our voltmeter data, while the oscilloscope I used had one million samples on the screen. A data point was taken every 5 microseconds, or a rate of 200,000 samples per second. Most voltmeters won't update any faster than about 4 times per second, even if your eyes could follow that fast. And if you could write them all down, you would never even come close to how fast the oscilloscope can take data and plot it on a graph. This becomes especially important when looking at much faster signals than a potentiometer. Most other things that you will use a scope for on a, on a vehicle happen in the millisecond range, and that makes a voltmeter nearly impossible to use for the same test that we use an oscilloscope for.
Another great thing about oscilloscopes is that they have more than one channel. Two to eight channels is pretty typical. This means you can monitor multiple things at the same time to see if there's a cause and effect. Since all channels follow the same time frame or same time scale, you'll be able to tell which fault occurred first or which one is the cause and which one is the effect. Here's an example from a GM car that also had a bad TBS. This was taken out on a test drive while the vehicle kept chugging and misfiring and jerking whenever I would hold the throttle in a certain, certain position. Here I'm using two channels. One is to monitor the throttle position signal, to, and you can see that it's dropping out very clearly. But the second channel is to monitor the 5 volt reference to the sensor, because I wanted to make sure that that wasn't dropping. This shows us that the problem is definitely on the sensor signal circuit and not on the voltage supply. So now the only, only thing that's left to determine is, is it the TPS itself or is the signal circuit somewhere chafing the ground? If you also notice, you can also see the same grass interference that we saw on my other capture earlier for my little remote car. This is coming from the ignition, uh, ignition coils. Underneath the hood, like I said before, is a very electrically noisy environment, and ignition noise is usually the one thing you will pick up above anything else. This Honda right here is a great example of why having more than one channel is beneficial. It had an ABS light on for a code for the right front wheel speed sensor. The shop had already put a new wheel speed sensor on it, and then they put an ABS control module on it. However, the new control module or the sensor, neither one fixed the problem. They were ready to put a second ABS control module on it, this time a new one instead of a used one, when they decided to give us a call. The tech that was working on the car said the problem was there was no voltage supplied to the wheel speed sensor. He said sometimes it would work if you would cycle a key back off, but after test driving it, it would eventually stop supplying voltage to the sensor again. Looking up a wiring diagram, we can see that all four wheel speed sensors are two wire sensors. The ABS control unit supplies power on one side, and the other side is labeled as ground. That's just how they have it labeled. That is technically the circuit, the signal side of the wheel speed sensor. And while it may be a resisted ground, it is not definitely not chassis ground or engine ground. The way this one works is the sensor can pull the voltage up on that signal side or ground side up to about one and a half volts and it will toggle as the tone ring passes the sensor. Now when diagnosing any vehicle it's important to understand the circuit logic. Unfortunately that logic is often not printed in service info and the only way to know it is through experience or have another vehicle to test. Since it's very rarely an option to have a second vehicle to test, it's important to try to remember strategies that you see and remember that other manufacturers might also use the same logic. Not understanding the logic behind a circuit will result in misdiagnosis. So many modules across many makes will turn off specific circuits when a fault is sensed. This is especially true with, say, oxygen sensor heater circuits. If they sense a problem with the oxygen sensor, the heater circuit, it will just turn off the O2 heater. So when you go to check it, the computer may not be controlling it, and you may attempt to condemn the computer when in reality it intentionally turned that, that O2 heater off. Now, I did not know that that was the case with this Honda, but I suspected it might be when we're talking about this wheel speed sensor and the ABS control module. So what we have here is two channels. The one is the voltage supply to the sensor and the second channel is the signal. Now if I throw a cursor up there it's pretty easy to see that the signal stops first and then the voltage supply stops. If we zoom in, this becomes much more apparent. Now this may be hard to see because the print's very small, 
But when I put up a second cursor and measure the amount of time that passed from when the sensor stopped working and when the module turned off power to the sensor, it's only 97 milliseconds. That's just under one-tenth of one second. Without two channels on a scope, I never would have been able to determine which happened first, the signal dropout or the loss of voltage supply. The fault with this vehicle was just a bad new part. The new sensor they had put on there was faulty. And I always remember that new and untested kind of mean the same thing in the world of automotive parts. So that should have answered the question of what is an oscilloscope. It is simply voltage graphed over time. That makes the voltage trends a little easier to see. Now, other things can also be graphed with an amp probe. You can graph amperage, and with a pressure transducer, you can see pressures and vacuum. And with a temp probe, you can see temperatures. However, all of these measurements require other tools because the oscilloscope only measures voltage. So if you want to see amperage, you have to have an amp probe that will measure the amperage and then output a voltage based on what it sees. Not all amp probes are the same either, so you have to know what the conversion rate is. For example, the amp probe I have up here on the screen is a very popular low amp probe from AESWave.com, and it has two settings. One setting is from 0 to 20 amps. On this setting, for every amp that this probe measures, it outputs 100 millivolts to your oscilloscope. So if you were to read 455 millivolts on your scope, then that means your amp probe is measuring 4.55 amps, a little over 4.5 amps. However, if you flip the switch to the 60 amp mode, it's a little less precise, but it will read a lot more amperage. It'll read up to 60 instead of just 20. But now the output is only 10 millivolts for every amp that it reads. So if you had it on the 60 amp setting and you read that same 455 millivolts, we would now be reading 45 and a half amps, not four and a half amps. That's much different. So it's very important that you understand how to use these tools and how to interpret the data and what the conversion rates is so that you can set up your uh, oscilloscope properly. Well, that wraps up this episode. I hope I answered the two questions that I posed at the beginning, which are, what is an oscilloscope and why do I need one? If you enjoyed this video, please come back for more episodes. Click the thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification and hit all notifications so that you don't miss any future episodes. The next episode will be more of a buyer's guide on which oscilloscopes are the best to buy for automotive applications. It will talk a little bit about uh, oscilloscope specifications, which ones matter, and how much do they matter. For every hour of video I produce, it takes me about 15 to 25 hours to write the class, record the video, edit the video, and then get it uploaded to YouTube. I really hope to keep this on the free side of YouTube for everyone to see, but if you want to help support the channel, you can do so through Patreon, and I really would appreciate it. Every little bit helps, even just five bucks or 10 bucks a month it goes a long way when you consider how much time I have to spend on these classes. So thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time. Have a good day.